there's a lot happening in psychedelic research at the moment. We just got the first study to compare a psilocybin to a conventional antidepressant, and there's also a new rodent study suggesting that the 5-HT2 receptors might not be necessary for at least some of psilocybin's therapeutic effects. So, what on earth is going on? Let's find out. Welcome to my channel. My name is Samuel Kohtala. I'm a neuropharmacologist studying the mechanisms of drug action in the brain. So, the study I'm discussing today is called Harnessing Psilocybin. Antidepressant-like behavioral and synaptic actions of psilocybin are independent of 5-HT2 receptor activation in mice. It's a paper by Hesselgrave and colleagues published in the journal PNAS. In the study, mice went through a chronic stress protocol to induce uh, depressive-like behaviors. The assays used particularly focused on reward behavior and anhedonia. The researchers also measured restoration in the function of stress-sensitive hippocampal excitatory synapses. Administration of psilocybin to these mice rescued the behavioral deficits 24 hours after the treatment. The most surprising claim of this paper is related to the use of catanserin to block the effects of psilocybin. When mice were pre-administered catanserin, a drug that blocks the function of 5-HT2A receptors, they didn't see an effect on the anhedonic-like measures. According to the authors, these results suggest that the 5-HT2A receptors are not required for the anti-anhedonic effects of psilocybin. Now, there's a long-standing consensus that 5-HT2A receptors mediate the psychedelic effects of classical psychedelics like psilocybin and LSD. This is supported by the fact that very specific ligands for this receptor produce potent psychedelic effects. Moreover, the 5-HT2A receptor antagonist catanserin has also been studied in humans and shown to block most of the psychedelic effects. But no trial has really looked at the effects of catanserin in blocking the therapeutic effects of psychedelics. So, even though most studies refer to psilocybin and most other psychedelics as agonists of the 5-HT2A receptors, could it be that these receptors are not required for the antidepressant uh, effects of psilocybin? This is what the study I'm discussing today looked at in a rodent model of depressive-like behavior. I'll try to give my perspective on this matter and uh, how to interpret these controversial findings. First of all, I'd like to point out that new exciting pharmacological mechanisms are popping out in the field of antidepressant research, like magic mushrooms are popping out after a session of heavy rain. A study some years ago suggested that ketamine's effects are not dependent on NMDA receptors, and more recently a study suggested that conventional antidepressants, as well as ketamine and its metabolite HNK, bind to the neurotrophin receptor track B. At this point, I'm just waiting for a paper to come up that shows how psilocybin directly binds to the track B receptors. I mean, that would make up a great story, don't you agree? These types of controversial papers generate a lot of attention for the journals they are published in. And this is of course what the scientific publishers uh, aim for. But I find it important to emphasize that one shouldn't make any true conclusions based on individual studies. Only after a, a number of other labs and researchers have replicated these findings, can we really start to assess their significance? The forefront of advancing knowledge is always messy, and while some of the new findings and ideas ultimately make it to textbooks, not all of them do. That's enough of that. Let me get back to the actual study and give my quick perspective on what I think are some of its limitations. I refer you to check the original paper for any thorough analysis, since I'm only focusing on select details here. First of all, it's a rodent study. 
While rodents are incredibly useful in medical research, there are limitations to what they can actually tell. A particularly difficult area of research is the study of psychiatric disorders, like depression, which are predominantly human disorders. There's a notoriously problematic gap in translating uh, research and results from preclinical studies to the actual clinical use. For example, to date there have been tens of potential preclinical drug candidates that have been developed as successors of ketamine as rapid-acting antidepressants. Yet, virtually all of these drugs have failed clinical trials despite showing preclinical potential. Second, Human 5-HT2A receptors are not identical to those of mice. The mouse receptor shares 91% of sequence identity with human receptors, and for example, psilocin has a lower efficacy at the mouse receptors when compared to human receptors. Moreover, there are many other differences in the serotonergic system as well. For example, mice and rats completely lack the gene encoding for the 5-HT1E receptors. These underlying limitations should be kept in mind when assessing the results of a study like this, uh, investigating the effects of psilocybin in rodents. Now, let's take a quick look at the actual study results. This graph shows results from the sucrose preference test, which essentially measures the hedonic drive of the stressed mice. The mice are offered a choice of water and a sucrose solution. After being stressed, mice become anhedonic and they don't care for the sweet solution that much anymore. Once they are given psilocybin, they start to prefer sucrose more, suggestive of an antidepressant-like effect. These results essentially suggest that blocking the 5-HT2A receptors with ketanserine does not affect the positive effects of psilocybin on sucrose drinking. But if you look more carefully at this uh, figure, here I counted the numbers of mice in each group and found them to vary from 6 to 13. I don't know what power calculation determines such group sizes, but I don't think it makes these comparisons particularly robust. I'm not an expert in statistics by any means, but I don't think the data here warrants the conclusions the authors make. In my mind, we should be looking at these three particular groups, and we should really focus our analyses on these groups. And I didn't see a statistical test comparing them directly. Moreover, since even the vehicle-treated group shows signs of improvement, it is not clear to me that the groups are sufficiently powered for these comparisons to give solid results. By the way, if you actually know something about statistics, and like me, uh, I'd be happy to hear your comments on the comment field down below. Let's go to figure 2. The head twitch response is one test which has been used to detect psychedelic effects in rodents. These head twitches are readily produced by 5-HT2A agonists, although some other drug classes can also produce head twitching behavior. The figure here is basically saying that pre-treatment with ketanserine at 2 mg per kilogram 60 minutes prior to psilocybin at 1 mg per kilogram prevents head twitching during the 15 minutes immediately following the drug injection in mice. Do you agree with these conclusions? To me, the number of mice per group seems rather low here. I'm not sure if the HTR was measured from all the animals that participated to the sucrose preference task, but the number of mice here is smaller, except that there's an extra animal in the ketanserine psilocybin group that wasn't in the previous figure. Based on this data, I don't think it's that clear that there was truly a significant blockade of the 5-HT2A receptors occurring in these animals although the authors back these claims by some electrophysiological data in the paper. The idea that only some population of the receptors was blocked would go well in hand with the trend of a reduced response in the sucrose preference for the ketanserine plus psilocybin group. 
with the variability in the group sizes and all the other things considered, I just don't think that this study uh, warrants the conclusions that the 5-HT2A receptor not being important for the effects of psilocybin here. But I'm sure future studies will be addressing this issue and will know soon enough. I'd be happy to hear what you think about this paper and the results and feel free to leave your opinion in the comments down below. That's it for today. Thank you for watching and I hope you'll subscribe for some future neuropharmacology content.